So, today we're gonna talk about Gaius Musonius Rufus, whom I don't know, and this is also the point of the article, because the article is called Who is Gaius Musonius Rufus? Getting to know the Roman Socrates, or Socrates, however you're actually pronouncing it, I don't know. Um, and yeah, I'm actually very interested in it, because I think that he is one of the stoic philosoph uh, philosophers that, um, that not too many people know, I guess, I don't know. You know, I just don't know him, you know, does this mean that it's just a lot of people don't know him? I don't know, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say so. <laughs> a little bit arrogant, kind of. <laughs> Low-key arrogant, but yeah, anyway, um, we're gonna go through this article. It is, it's not that long, you know, it's, 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 well, it is quite a little bit of reading and um, I am gonna read quite a little bit today. So yeah, I'm gonna just start ahead and uh, we are, no, 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 we are gonna see. The name Gaius Musonius Rufus may not sound familiar, but the work of the foremost Stoic of his day, as Roman historian Tectus prefers referring to him, will. Musonius' influence in Stoicism was and is substantial. Equally so is the praise spoken in his name by those who were well familiar with it. Origen himself, or Origen, however, called the greatest genius the early church ever produced, what, 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 himself called the greatest genius the early church ever produced wrote in his defense of Christianity contra Celsus that there were two men whose lives everyone else should model theirs. Socrates and Musonius, the Roman emperor, nearly three centuries after Musonius lived, Julian wrote in a letter of unexplained admiration of Theodorus, comparing his display of a clear proof of the philosophic mind amidst indisputably unfair treatment to that of Musonius. Sis. And not Aurelius' meditation makes an important reputal for criticism related to all the wealth the Roman Stoics enjoyed. That reputal was in a form of clarifying what was more common of a Stoic's financial standing. And there is a little bit of a quote. Not all Stoics were wealthy senators. There was another kind of Stoic exemplar as well. The outsider whose ascetic lifestyle won him the admiration of his wealthier contemporaries and enabled him to criticize the pretenses of upper class society with real authority. An early example of the type is Gaius Musonius Rufus, a member of the Roman administrative class, the so-called knights or equites, who was banished by both Nero and Vespasian. And I do also want to point out what about Epictetus? Epictetus was a fucking slave. Think about that, you know, not all of them were just rich. Exiled three times in all, Musonius unbreakable devotee uh, devotion to his stoic beliefs and his his steady, uh, though uncompanied, uh, opposition to the emperor Nero's ruthless behavior earned his undivided reference. The man that refused to obey Nero, we, uh, we are equally indebted to his contrarian view of exile. In his time, death would have been favored, preferable to control your circumstances than surrender to the command of another, or so most perceived. Even Therese uh, Thracia, Musonius' sometimes anti-Nero ally, would say, I would sooner be killed today than banished tomorrow in his moments of yielding to compliance. Musonius was perplexed but unappreciated by such an opinion. If you choose, and this is a quote, once again, if you choose death because it is a greater evil, what sense is there in that? Or if you choose it as the lesser evil, remember who gave you the choice. Why not try coming to terms with what you have been given. Which is a pretty good point, and I've actually thought about the same thing, like, when you're dead, you're dead, you know? But when you're living, you can actually make something quite, quote-unquote, good out of a bad situation, no matter how bad it is, because, of course, if it is really bad, then, no, it's not good. Musonius stood firm in his belief that having everything taken from you just meant you were left with the only things you needed, your soul, your body, your mind. With those three things, exile is far from an evil, it is an opportunity, an opportunity for one's own cultivation, an opportunity to practice virtue, controlling what one can, maintaining indifferent of possessions, making a choice. His choice was to accept banishment as an opportunity to use what Stoicism taught him, to not talk in theory but display in action. And after the deaths of both Nero and Vespasian, Musonius returned to his native land, soon becoming a prominent teacher of Stoicism. His fundamental teaching, practice trumps theory, which is uh, fucking amazing, you know, and I, I, I really am an advocate of that, but it is difficult, you know, it is very difficult, I would say, because, you know, yeah, 
is there some type of exile at this point in time? No, unless you're just uh, willing to go into prison. But this is not necessarily something that that makes sense, kinda. But anyway, well, I mean, hmm, hmm. I mean, it is actually kind of the same. So regarding stoicism and regarding practicing stoicism, it might actually be uh, quite a quote unquote good move. I don't know. I don't necessarily think that you have to do this. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, some of his lessons survive or something. No, survive. Thanks to two of his students, Lucius and Polio. In lectures and fragments where frequent he uh, analogized stoicism to other learned skills, he relates it to the musician who can re Guritate, regurgitate uh, any book on a topic but never stopped to actually play an instrument versus the musician who never put down his instrument to pick up a book or the ship captain who has steered countless boats though can't precisely recite the operator's manual while the other did memorize the manual though never piloted the ship or the physician whose depth of med medical knowledge in dialogue impresses but they have never tended to a uh, patient and the other who couldn't lead uh, discussions groups but heals the uh, groups but 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 heals the sick every day in accordance with the correct medical theories those groups might discuss might discuss Musonius did teach Stoic philosophy, but students gathered more because the lecturer, long before proclaiming the virtue in Stoicism, practiced it without deviating even when striped of life or stripped of life and banished without good reason. His students listened with great intent because he spoke from great experience and not from great uh, theoretical knowledge. Yeah. Bitch. <laughs> anyway, the name of least... Uh, the name of at least one of those students will sound familiar. Epictetus, who along with Marcus Aurelius and Seneca make up the big three of Stoic philosophers. The biography written inside Epictetus' discourses details how once enslaved, Epictetus became a widely regarded teacher. Musonius Rufus receives or receives much of the credit. It's yeah, it's receives of the credit. A slave granted in frequent brief liberation, Epictetus spent whatever freedom afforded him attending Musonius's lectures. The influence Musonius had on Epictetus is both explicitly stated and, ex and implicitly evident in his teaching. Both men concentrated on ethics without distracting in ethical theorizing, more focused on real life application, and both, though having forgivable reasons to react in anger or with hatred, found strength from within when life was unjustly difficult. And there is a quote once again. Musonius uh, used to test me by saying, your master is going to afflict you with some hardship or other. And when I would answer, such is life, he would say, should I still intercede with him when I can get the same things from you? For in fact, it is silly and pointless to try to get from another person what one can get for oneself. Since I can get greatness of soul and nobility from myself, why should I look to get a farm or money or some office from you? I will not be so insensible of what I already know. Epictetus. Which I think is actually pretty amazing. It actually is amazing. I have to highlight it. And I do just see that in the past few days where I've been going through just quite a lot of really good articles and interesting ones, I haven't highlighted quite anything. Not good. Anyway, Musonius first outlasted banishment and the uh, very tenets he so steadfastly employed later guided his student, Epictetus, and his response to and overcoming of enslavement. We, not just, we, not just Epictetus, Oh, Musonius tremendous amounts of gratitude. Consider, if Musonius engaged the influences of popular opinion and preceded or precedent, he wouldn't have withstood the manipulations of the tyrannical and deranged narrow. He would have uh, hey, he would have rathered death than exile, or when exiled, he would not have returned to the place where he endured so much cruelty, cruelty, I'm sorry, violence and political gridlock. Had Musonius yielded to Nero, chosen death, or opted to life or live out his years happily removed from Rome and its dis turbulences, any one of which historians still would pardon without hesitancy, his teaching career never happens. Where then would Epictetus have gone when his master allowed him momentary freedom? It's Musonius's, it's Musonius we can thank for the work of Epictetus. Therefore, it is Musonius too we can thank for the work of Marcus Aurelius and 
You know, in the first book of his meditations titled Deaths and Lessons, Marcus thanks one of his philosophy teachers, Rusticus, for introducing me to Epictetus' lectures and loaning me his own copy. Which is a quote, by the way. Um, actually, a little bit of a problem that I'm having in general with Daily Stoics articles is that um, often they are... Um, the sentences aren't written in a way that makes them very easy to read, to be honest. Um, and I'm actually seeing this. This is the first time when I'm actually seeing it, you know. Well, you know, I, I'm still going to go through it. It's not like, you know, I can't go through it and stuff. Um, but I notice that it is making it a bit difficult. Musonius Rufus set the standard for many core Stoic principles. Amor fati, uh, pre meditatio, uh, malorum, malorum, obstacles as opportunity. <laughs> That's nice. Amor fati, pre meditatio, uh, polarum, and obstacles as opportunity. Well, training perception, controlling what you can control while indifferent to everything else. These at varying degrees can all be traced to kind of life Musonius's Missionaries lived then taught. Below are three themes recurring among any still discoverable text he is mentioned. On practice and theory. Whether the problem arose for us or his students, whether habit or theory was better for getting virtue, if by theory is meant what teaches us correct conduct and by habit we mean being accustomed to act according to this theory. Musonius thought habit to be more effective. From lectures. Okay, amazing. The Roman Stoics, in hopes of making progress and out of living, emphasized habit habitual behavior. We are a product of our habits, they would say. Musonius was the forebearer of taking what you learn from books or admirers and uh, putting it in practice. The only way a good habit can form and in making habit habitual a virtue, he had this to say. Virtue is not simply theoretical knowledge, but it is practical application as well. So a man who wishes to become good not only must be thoroughly familiar with the perspect percepts which are conductive to virtue, but must also be earnest and zealous in applying these principles. Musonius Rufus Lectures Courage can't simply be something you read about, notes thoroughly kept, then suddenly what before seemed dreadful is no longer feared. No, the courage is claimed only through diligent displays where providing, um, where proving unmoved in the face of danger. That goes the same for temperance, prudence, patience, and stoic virtue hoped to be groomed into a habit. Definitely case, you know, you can't also read about fucking push-ups, you know. If you read about them, it's not gonna get you anywhere on money and materials. That God uh, who made man provided him food and drink for the sake of preserving preserving his life and not for giving him pleasure, one can see very well from this. When food is uh, performing its real function, it does not produce pleasure for a man that is in the process of digestion and assimilation. Musonius Rufus, which by the way is also a stoic thing, you know, not seeking pleasure in anything. And, um, and I don't know, I still get pleasure out of eating, I gotta have to say that. Um, but yeah, but yeah, um, I do want to point out that this leads to eating healthier because, um, well, hmm. I mean, of course, there's quite a lot of unhealthy things that are not just very, you know, tasty and stuff, but I would say and argue that more things that are healthy, extremely healthy, are not that tasty, you know, but because you're not eating for pleasure, but just because you want to fuel your body and you want to just um, have a healthy body, you're still going to do it and you're still going to eat those things that you may be not necessarily like, you know, just because they're healthy and you know they're healthy and you know that when you eat these things on a regular basis, then you're going to feel better. So yeah, uh, Musonius, if presented the choice, said he would rather be sick than to live luxuriously. Sickness only harms the body, living in luxury harms the body and the soul. Well, I, you know, I wouldn't say so, but yeah. Ask as he liked to, why am I spending money on this thing? To fulfill a need or for an outward display of extravagance. Society wants us to be fancy, to have expensive things, to one-up that co-worker keep up with the Joneses. Musonius would have the Joneses on, what, on buy and uses his money for what's uh, truly impressive. How much better is it to be known for doing well by many than for living extravagantly? How much worthy than spending on sticks and stones is to spend on people? Actually pretty amazing. Lectures 19.91. Uh, 26 to 28 
What do you want to be known for? Having nice things or doing good things? Well, I gotta have to say, like, yeah, this is amazing. This really is amazing because, because yeah, it's definitely the case. I know most often spending it on vacation, spending it on um, experiencing something, spending it on other people is going to be amazing. And we're spending it on yourself, but not in a material way, but in terms of like books. But then again, okay, you're going to be remembered for, you know, being the guy or the gal or the girl that is having uh, a lot of books and not necessarily this person that is a, a really nice person, so to speak, on having everything you need. Indeed, how could exile be an obstacle to a person's own cultivation or to attaining virtue when no one has ever been cut off from learning or practicing what is needed by exile? Abhijit has often said some version of the following. Philosophy does not claim to secure for us anything outside our control. Otherwise, it would be taking on manners that do not concern it. For as wood is the material of the carpenter and marble that of the sculptor, so the subject matter of the art or life is the life of self. Even as Kim, through his teacher's lectures, makes obvious teacher's lectures makes obvious that Musonius' model of always being content with one did have rather than mulling over what one could have became a significant shared belief of Epictetus. So yeah, we do indeed have quite a lot of things, and there's always going to be some things that we don't have, but focusing on those things that we already have and we are grateful for just makes more sense. Masonius practice of severe self-discipline and an, an abstention from all forms of indulgence became a trait even the wealthy invite, or invite, however. Masonius wasn't born to fabulous wealth, nor did he seek to acquire fabulous wealth. There is that fable of the fisherman returning to shore with his small row boat uh, filled with fish. He is approached by a businessman with an offer that proves uh, the pro promises the fishermen great success if they start a company, get a bigger boat, catch more fish, build a grand uh, distribution facility, and so on. In a few short years, the businessman assures or assures he'll have a mansion, and not long he'll be able to finally retire and spend the rest of his life or the, the rest of his years fishing. The fisherman is confused. Isn't that what I'm doing now? For the fisherman, like Musonius, seeking material pleasure only stole time from pursuing where life's pleasures actually lived, the self. And I know the story from the Why Cafe, which is a book, uh, amazing book, was recommended to me, shout out to you, thank you once again, it's an amazing book, I highly recommend. The obscurity which has dimmed the name of Musonius Rufus is one of the great historical accidents. The testimonial of Asian writers lends to the realization that Musonius was indeed one of the most significant figures of his time. A wildly more captivating luminary than his surviving works enable us to be made aware Musonius Rufus should here forward be a name mentioned among great Stoics like Marcus Aurelius Seneca and and there is once again, as always, some quotes which are uh, amazing. I hope, at least. If you accomplish something good with hard work, the labor passes quickly, but the good endures. If you do something shameful in pursuit of pleasure, the pleasure passes quickly, but the shame endures. So, put in the work and do something great. We begin to lose our hesitation to do immoral things when we lose our hesitation to speak of them. That's definitely the fucking case. You know, who speaks about stealing money? Who speaks about hurting somebody uh, willingly and stuff like that? Nobody. The human being is born with an inclination toward virtue. Kinda, yeah. Hmm. What good are gilded rooms or precious stones fitted on the floor, inlaid in the walls, carried from great distances at the greatest expense? These things are pointless and unnecessary. Without them, isn't it possible to live healthy? Aren't they the source of constant trouble? Don't they cost vast sums of money that through public and private charity may have benefited many? You will earn the respect of all if you begin by earning the respect of yourself. Don't expect to encourage good deeds in people conscious of your own misdeeds. That's amazing. It's definitely the case. For mankind, evil is injustice and cruelty and indifference to a neighbor's trouble, while virtue is brotherly love and goodness and justice and benefic beneficence and concern for the welfare of your neighbor. For what does the man who accepts insult do that is wrong? It is the doer of wrong who puts themselves to shame. The sensible man wouldn't go to the law since he wouldn't even consider that he had been insulted. Besides, uh, to be annoyed or angered about such things would be 
Patty instead easily and silently bear what has happened since this is appropriate for those whose purpose is to be noble-minded. Which is also amazing. I like all of these quotes. They are fucking good. Wealth is able to buy the pleasure of eating, drinking and other ses- sensual pursuits yet can never afford a cheerful spirit of freedom from sorrow. Last one. Just as there is no use in medical study unless it leads to the health of the human body, so there is no use to a philosophical doctrine unless it leads to the virtue of the human soul. Makes sense? Makes sense? Well, I can just say, yeah. True. And yeah, uh, this is also the end of this episode and of this article. And yeah, I hope that I've been able to go through some things that you were interested in. I hope that my reading wasn't too bad. I know today's reading was, you know, quite not that good. Yesterday was way better. But I don't know why. You know, I've drank enough. I've even just been eating something. It's difficult to to say why. I've also been sleeping a lot. Um, It's strange. You know, this is my point. My point is, it is strange. And um, yeah, it is what it is. Anyway, I wish you the best health of heaven and all the success and also hope that you're going to remind yourself and you're going to be remembered. Which basically means your legacy basically means just being a nice person and then being remembered as a nice person, which is a pretty fucking cool thing. Three other questions that I'm have you are why? Are you here? What are you trying to change and what is bothering you the most? These three questions are hopefully going to show you your purpose and maybe even a business idea, which is a pretty fucking cool thing. Um, another question, which is the last one that I'm have you is, what could you essentially say to another person that is... Um, that is really going to change their life, you know, because I totally believe that we all can say something and we all can um, also do something uh, that is, but especially say that is really going to change somebody's life, you know, I totally believe in that, I I really uh, totally do, but yeah, Um, hopefully we'll see you next time, please stay healthy and safe and also uh, I hope that your family is healthy and safe, not your family, but your family should be safe. Um, yeah. Hopefully, we'll see you the next time. So, bye bye.